Uh, this past week we were covering Delia Derbyshire of the BBC Radiophonic Workshop. Um, we had a lot of fun with that. I'm just finishing up uh, steeping some tea, which I'm having fun with listening to the sound of the stupor going through the tea. It makes a really creepy, gurgly sound. Um, so hopefully you're getting uh, your hot beverage ready, or if it's evening, maybe a stronger type of beverage to join us today to kick off a week talking about Pierre Schaefer. Um, there's going to be a lot of French in this conversation that we cannot pronounce. I'm not even going to attempt it. We're not going to attempt it, so... I'm going to use a lot of uh, acronyms and everything they give me that's not in French. <laughs> yeah, all the acronyms will be used. So, uh, Pierre Schaeffer, uh, the Frenchman who uh, defined, you could say invented, but I'd say more... Discovered. Discovered, coined the term, musique concrète. There's all of our French right there. Uh so it's uh, prior to, so we're kind of going backwards a little bit. We're going across the European continent and we're going back in time to talk about the beginning, the origins of tape music here. Um, because tape music didn't exist before, there was tape to use. Problem. <laughs> big, big, big problem. So yeah. the time frame that we are covering is pretty determined by the uh, availability of these technologies being invented and being widely available for use, and the way that they're used, so. But that was probably one of the reasons why, um, you know, the desire for, um, you know, Pierre to, you know, make, you know, dedicate his life to, to making such discoveries was of importance to the radio broadcast company that he worked for. Uh, do you know the name of it? Yeah, so we can start there. I would say we... Uh, you know, we're not biographers, so, you know, the start of his life and how he got into music and all of that um, is on the internet, of course. Uh, I did find it interesting that his parents were both musicians, uh, which I think is pretty rare. Like, um, a couple of people that we've talked about have come to mind that had musician parents. I think you had to be either, like, given piano lessons or something, or exposed to music in some way at ah, age. Ah, which brings up my whole theory that, you know, in, in olden times, mm. uh, it was much more common for you to get musical training by just sort of existing. Like your, It was one of your regular lessons. Of, your regular schooling like included. Like reading, writing, and music. Music, more, and, and that has gone to the wayside as we have progressed. There has been a lot of funding cut for I art and music programs. I severely disagree. <coughs> Excuse me. Yes. I su I severely the disagree. social sciences disagree with you as well. So it is proven that Tangent music over. helps us learn other things better too. Makes us smarter. So uh, you may be right about that, that it was more common to have music lessons uh, in the olden times, the vague olden times. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so he was, yeah, Pierre Schaefer was exposed to music at a young age um, by his parents and in his schooling. And he went on to get a degree in radio broadcasting. Which I would say was probably a, a lot more practical at mm -hmm. that time than you might think. Well, it's also, uh, we're heading into World War II, so the use of radio in the war was very crucial and very, uh, you know, well, it was highly trained and... It was the main source of, like, local communication, you know, mass communication. As well as mil military communication. Yeah. So, yeah, and, and the tie-in with military, you know, I would say that makes a lot, you know, once again, you know... So the, one of the most common themes we have in all of our research so far. You know, y you could easily make a case for, you know, there being a, a career you know, in working for your country, um, if you learned the art of, you know, communication and uh, using technology. Uh, yeah, it was very cutting edge at the time. I'm curious, so I'm going to have a lot of, I have a lot of questions about Pierre Schaefer and... Who are we going to ask these A lot questions? of things. I'm going to be asking <laughs> the group and I'm going to be asking the internet and hopefully as we all put our heads together, we will be able to find some answers. 
We've but asked the internet a lot. I have already. a lot more questions than <laughs> I have answers today, but I would say one of my first questions is, um, you know, why did he decide to go into radio broadcasting? And, you know, what was that program like? And what kind of technology was he exposed to? Um, as opposed to, because he is listed first as a composer. And on most of the people that we've studied, um, you know, have degrees in music or composition or an instrument. Um, and so his being in radio broadcasting is a little off the beaten path here. But I'm curious, I need to find um, exactly when he went to school for radio broadcasting, because if it's, let's see, he was born in 1910. So yeah, so yeah. He actually began a career as a writer. I'm mm. just now seeing. There's so much. So I'd say um, he's definitely one of the pioneers of tape music. I mean, it's hard to just say tape music for him because he did so much and he coined the term music concrete, but... Mainly because he was doing it, like you said, before tape. He was doing it before tape. So, so that's one of the more interesting things. Rode the wave. Um, it's hard. It's sort of like, I feel like the spokes of a uh, bicycle wheel um, where you know, as it spins, it all looks like one thing, but if you slow it down, you can see all the individual pieces. Mm. And Ooh, I like that. that's how I feel about, you know, his life and work and talking about him and researching him. Um, you could say, oh yeah, he's the godfather of sampling, he's tape music, he's music concrete, but each individual spoke uh, could take you off in a million different directions, but they're all connected and speak to each other and his interest in um, innovation in sound, just as an idea. So he's also like a philosopher thinker as well. Mm. So it's hard. It's hard to know where to start and where to take this conversation. So feel free to chime in with any thoughts and questions. Um, yeah, you know, if you have any thoughts along us. the way uh, regarding Pierre Schaefer, uh, you know, just throw them in, in the uh, comments. Or feed. terms like electroacoustic music, concrete. Um, we call it tape music because it's. We are specifically interested in music that's made with magnetic tape. But it's probably good to start with the fact that he was in radio broadcasting and he was working for, um, since we were just talking about the BBC Radiophonic Workshop, it's equivalent to the BBC in France. Mm. Um, he was working for, I believe it's called the RDF. We're using acronyms because we don't want to say the French wrong. Um, the RDF. <laughs> he was working for sort of like the national radio um, in France. And um, he kind of proposed to them that he wanted to start his own little studio um, researching sound. And they let him. They were like, you know what? <laughs> Nobody else is doing that. Sure. So they let him do that. And he was able to build his own studio, which um, had, I've heard a couple names thrown out. Um, Club Desai. Hmm. Um, I hadn't heard that one. Oh, yeah, I'm seeing that right now. The GRM. Um, well, I think so that's what like it evolved, evolved into. It was the GCRM, mm -hmm. I think. GRMC, sorry. <laughs> GRMC, and then it sort evolved of like the group, into the GRM, which still exists today. The and group for Research of Music Concrete. Small tangent. Um, okay. I actually remember the GRM Tools uh, plugins back in the early... 2000s um, when I first got into audio production and they were a suite of plugins that were uh, designed by the people involved with the INA and the, and the GRMC and, and you know I'm gonna throw a few more acronyms out mm -hmm. there but like um, you know they basically uh, made plugins that um, dealt with um, some of the more interesting concepts involving the physics of sound, like there was like a Doppler effect plugin, um, you know, and I, I just remember like they were some of the most fun plugins to automate and, and they would do crazy stuff with your voice. And I think I read an article that like Radiohead was using them and so I'm like, oh, Radiohead, you know. Got it. They're doing, it. they're doing some weird stuff, you know, like I, I gotta use this. So, you know, anyway. So that all came from the people that, so Pierre Schaefer was mentoring and teaching people, composers, I would say, mostly men. I know of Elian Radik, she's the one woman I know of, but I think it was mostly men, let's be real, um, who were coming to work in the studio uh, through the radio station that it was part of, mm -hmm. uh, and 
learning from him. And then kind of, he at one point uh, kind of let the reins go because I'm going to say this is in the late 70s. Um, he didn't really, well, he was much older and kind of at the end of his career, although he did live until the 90s. Um, he kind of let the students run the show at that point because they were interested in taking things in a different direction. And I would say that had to do with the synthesizer. And so... The, the evil synthesizer. He was pretty hardcore about uh, music concrete being uh, sounds... Recorded to tape? Pre-recorded sounds. And not sounds. He was sound really sources. into the concept of, he got into this very early on where, you know, I guess, you know, he his initial recordings were of, you know, things like trains and like he was really into like the, the natural sound of, of those recordings. Um, but I think he got upset with the way that people comprehended those compositions my understanding is he was a little bit cranky that <laughs> <laughs> there wasn't an, general, an audience maybe a little cantankerous for cantankers. his pioneering ideas about sound and that he got so much push pushback from the actual you know high-minded music society type people um who you know most people said this isn't music um or it was hard to listen to it wasn't an enjoyable experience um, but he was trying to innovate a whole new way of experiencing sound and thinking about sound and making sound art. He and that's hard to do. Like, if you're going to be an innovator, that's, you know, you're, it's a lonely path. But he was one of the ones who's really surrounded by a lot of people, more than anyone else that we've researched, that I see he did have a lot of people who were really interested and sort of inspired by him, who wanted to work with him. Um, Pierre Henri was his partner. Um, Early on, yeah. So he always had someone around him, and he inspired people. He must have been a good teacher. So there was always a lot of people around to bounce these ideas off of. So it wasn't like he was completely in a vacuum. Like when I think about Raymond Scott and how much he spent his life... He was a loner. ...alone yeah. and afraid people were going to steal his ideas and things like that, whereas Pierre Schaefer was trying to spread the ideas and teach the ideas and have other people kind of run with them. He was into collaborations and he started organizations and yeah, it seems like he was a little more a bit more social. Yeah, but he was also kind of in the um he had the support of his uh probably publicly funded national radio yeah. uh organization. So Money talks. he was given the space, he was given the studio, he was given the funding, he was given the support. So he was able to innovate because of this, whereas other people, like I mentioned, Raymond Scott, were really on their own um, funding things themselves or, you know, trying to get other people to fund it for them and convincing and selling people on their ideas, whereas Pierre Schaefer was able to um, just kind of pull up and run with his ideas, which is sort of the um, more of like a university model. You know, if you're a professor and you have the support of your university, like you're tenured or something, and you, ha you can study and have students and things like that helping you. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. I mean, it, it seemed like he definitely had, like you said, support. Um, one thing that I was kind of getting at, like, before was, you know, he, he recorded the sounds of these trains, mm -hmm. and then he quickly moved on to wanting to mask and, and deteriorate and uh, obscure yes. the sounds that he was using. So, you know, that... that um, brief honeymoon of I love you know these natural beautiful sounds mm -hmm. that I'm capturing and I'm just going to you know put them on you know mix them together in, in various ways and, and call it music um, I, I would I would think that he probably got a good amount of pushback for doing that and so he quickly then doubled down sort mm. of on the idea People were like of, this isn't music he was like I'll show you <laughs> yeah he, he sort of doubled down on the idea that like you know what I'm going to completely mess these sounds up I'm going to make them unrecognizable from from the source which but yes this is his whole theory has a technical term right yes yeah, so this term came much later from what I've read um because music concrete was the first term that he coined to describe obviously concrete music which he called it this because it was music that was made from being recorded to, well, he wasn't using tape right away, but 
the sound source was concrete. You couldn't write the music down and then perform it on any instrument. It was concrete, it was uh, unreproducible, especially because at that time, if you wanted to hear the music, you had to come to his studio and listen to the recording. You couldn't take it with you, it couldn't be, you know, duplicated and given to you. Um, he did play some of it on the radio and it was not well received. <laughs> um, what was he using if he wasn't using tape? A phonograph. Oh, okay. So he was so the first, direct to disc? <laughs> yeah, the first, uh, that first recording Cylinder, of the train. Cylinder, maybe? The first recording of the train was like acetate discs, I want to say. I need to pull all of this up. Um, gotcha. But he he recorded it to these this format and then played it on four phonographs. Multiple recorders. And then mm -hmm. had it live. He was cutting it to a disc. Uh, you know, sort of like <laughs> if we had... If you were like scratching or whatever. That's why I laugh when people say that, you know, like DAWs have like, oh, they have a learning curve. You know, it's like, dude, like. <laughs> so this is beyond. So he was, um, he was kind of coming up with the idea, but uh, magnetic tape hadn't been, that idea hadn't even come into play yet, but it was very quickly developed because things were going on in Germany as well that were, uh, I believe Germany is where they uh, developed the idea for magnetic tape with um, the, uh, I have heard the, that, the yeah. conductive powder, mm -hmm. um, which again, oxide, oxide, sorry, which was then uh, also further developed because it was kind of a uh, poisonous. Uh, <laughs> mm. So, so don't um, go licking your tapes. So they they fixed that since oh, then. Because okay. it used to be that when you were working with tape, the powder would be like flying everywhere <laughs> and you would be inhaling that uh, poison. Um, so acetate disc is what he was working with initially for, so his most famous work is um, the song for trains. And again, we're not saying the French because we don't want to say it wrong. Um, but the- you Oh, know, you mean Etude au Chemin de Feu? Yeah, that's the one actually. Um, <laughs> so an acetate disc is a type of God, I, phonograph I know record. I botched that. I don't know any, I did <laughs> not take a single French class, so I don't even know how to poorly pronounce. Neither of us did any French. French, so yeah, we're, I'm, we're I'm kind out of, of the loop. We're in the weeds here, you'll have to help us out. So I'm actually gonna um, throw a link in here about acetate discs, that's where we're gonna start. <laughs> um, because this is what he started with. Um, so I'm gonna read a little bit about this. Uh, an acetate disc is a type of phonograph record, a mechanical sound storage medium widely used from the 30s to the late 50s for recording and broadcasting purposes. It was pre-vinyl, right? Like the yeah. pre-vinyl -pre vinyl. They're also known as lacquer. <laughs> Ah, uh, yeah. And um, I think they're still used as the initial, like, master copy in the vinyl creation process. Perhaps like, it's Like, I'm pretty sure that you do, like, an acetate lacquer, mm -hmm. and then uh, you get your, you know, like, copies from that. Like, you make the copies from the acetates. Too. Acetates are usually made by dubbing from a master recording in another medium, such as magnetic tape. In the vinyl record manufacturing process, an acetate master disc is cut and electroforming is used to make negative metal molds from it. So I've heard that that is actually the part of the process that is... That's why it's so expensive to press vinyl. <laughs> is Makes it expensive and I think is like one of the materials or maybe acetate in itself is like harder to manufacture mm. or is becoming more rare, like some of the chemicals. Mm -hmm. And so it's like kind of becoming this thing that we may die, you know, like it, we may run out or something like that. Ooh, we should look yeah. into that too. Um, it does say that unlike ordinary vinyl records, which are quickly formed from lumps of plastic, by a mass production molding process, a so-called acetate disc is created by using a recording lathe to cut an audio signal modulated groove onto the surface of a special lacquer coated blank disc. A real time operation requiring expensive, delicate equipment and expert skill for good results. It just sounds like there's so much margin for error there. Like, I can't believe that. Yeah, and that's how he started. We with figured, A, that we figured that record. out. I mean, I know that was like Thomas Edison, right? Like, but. Well, we went from. Um, 
printing, uh, recording music to wire on these big steel drums that um, would decapitate people. It could, de <laughs> it could decapitate people. Um, wow. It was very dangerous. See, we have so, a risky job here. As <laughs> that audio. was in like the turn of the century, so like the late the 1890s through like the 1930s before acetate discs came into play. Um, they were in apparently at the Maida Vale Studios, the BBC Radiophonic Workshop. Uh, was housed in the Maida Vale Studios. Apparently there they were using these steel drums with the metal wire to mm. record. And if you wanted to edit the recording, you had to weld. Wow. That sounds a lot so harder like than splicing tape. When that's, that makes sense now. Cause Industrial like, revolution times. I would say today, you know, people complain about, you know, even thinking about the idea of having to splice tape, mm -hmm. right? Like I know it makes uh, sequencers sound super chill. <laughs> from you know, since were invented because you know so many people hated the process of splicing, of splicing tape. tape. But I could see how if you came up the ranks, you know, using these alternative processes that that predated tape, you hit tape and you were like, Hallelujah, mm -hmm. holy crap! <laughs> <laughs> um, now it, you know. Audio is, I'm just going to, and it's interesting because like we listened through a ton of uh, Pierre Schaefer music and later in his career, like we're talking like 70s, you get yeah. into like his tape stuff and his tape stuff is like insane. It's like he went from like, well, yeah, it was actually a two track yeah, tape, 60s. you know, like cassette boom box mm -hmm. to Ableton Live, like, you know, like in terms of like the detail and just the amount of tracks and everything well, that he had going on. The amount of work he had to put in to even know what he was doing up to that point meant that once he got those tools in his hands, he was It fine. was easy. He, yeah, he was, he was like, man, like, he, I almost feel like, you know, he it must be hard. I found, you know, audio this way, like when I got in, I mean, my introduction was through like the digital tools. And I remember after I learned like the initial, um, you know, techniques, I was like, oh man, like, I feel like I, I know how to do everything. Like it's, this is boring. Like what, what is there left to discover? You know, like, and I feel like these, um, tape musicians, you know, must've, you know, hit a point where they never, you know, they must have never felt like they, you know, ran into that until maybe tape. It's interesting to see like wherever Whereas something started. Now they're like, started. oh, we can we can buy this stuff. You know, it was expensive at first. I feel like once tape became cheap, that was sort of like a new era. Yeah, absolutely. Because these things were being invented as he was inventing music concrete um, and tape music itself. So like the companies uh, like. I want to say Ampex, Ampex, which was Bing Crosby. <laughs> That's a fun story. He was like the initial. He was going around Europe telling everyone to buy these seed machines. investor of um, that company, I believe. Yeah, he so bought it Ampex. I want to say in nineteen. Oh, I want to get these dates right. Nineteen fifty-two. We're not historians. Is people. when um, it became available to even use, but it was still very expensive. So only places like these radio stations um, or universities were having any access to it. So if you were there, born at the right place at the right time, in the right job with the right access, then you were going to get to experience this. Which is similar to the history of synthesizers. You know, synthesizers were only available. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they were huge and expensive. And higher needed uh, a truck caliber to move audio them. institutions, yeah. Um, I just wanted to say one more thing about that first song about the trains. Um, Train song. And I'm trying to find it. Sorry. So that Let's was just the etude. The etude, but they're all etudes. <laughs> they're all etudes. Um, so the first uh, attempt that he made at, um, and you know, at the same time, uh, people like John Cage were also interested in the same kind of idea. So did you share that article by not, the way? Not yet. It's I'm killer. going to. Okay. This is the best one. This is the guide to Pierre Schaefer Ultimate. Um, there were a few people in different places in the world who were all kind of interested in the same idea of concrete sound, of sound, or music being made from sound that is already recorded to a medium. Um, but again, these ideas were forming in the ether, but there weren't the... Tools. And the ether was really the name for it, because it still blows my mind every time I think about the fact that, like, there was these 
collaborations and things being in the ether without there being an internet. That just... Yeah, it's pretty cool. Well, there's like all these uh, theories about that um, throughout history that people in different places in the world were coming up with the same idea at the same time. Right. About like mathematics and certain things like that. And it makes me feel like the internet just ruins things in that regard because like it would still happen it's making things happen faster it it's would, hard yeah. to know where they begin right um so he spent an afternoon at a train station and he recorded various samples of noises and um then he you know it's he was fascinated with recording sound for sound's sake so we could, you know, I feel like theorizing and philosophizing about sound is really what he was That would be, by the way, in. a really cool concept for a silent film. Of um, him doing this? Of, like, just basically being a person who's documenting that day of his mm -hmm. from the perspective of, like, we're spying on him doing it. Mm -hmm. He's not aware. Yeah. But just, like, an account uh, you know, someone's noticing that he's doing this and they just start filming him, just like, you know, people would film, like, bridges falling apart. Like, <laughs> like I don't know, I just think that would be a cool... I love that idea. ...cool concept. Um, yeah, I'm not finding it here, but I heard it in a podcast somewhere that he, um, he had these um, sounds recorded to acetate disc and he was playing them on four different phonographs and then cutting it to another disc. So he was live sampling, basically, to create this track, um, which is just insane to think about. But um, he quickly, Was he actually, like, busing, like, was he doing the work at the station kind of thing? Was he, like, recording stuff and playing stuff back and, like, moving it, like, that day? Like, like, I feel like it was all happening live, yeah. He was recording from the four all at live. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, it's really insane. I'm going to drop really, this. really, really crazy. Like, this in here as well. This is the So he was garage. essentially like the first laptop musician. Yeah. <laughs> in a he way, developed like, all the, the techniques that we still use today um, in pretty much every kind of music all over the world. You see people with their like OPZs and, you know, these like little, you know, portable video game like type, you know, music making devices, you know, like there's like a Game Boy one and like all this stuff. You know, and I feel like he was, you know, basically doing his own version of that, but yeah, he had he's like a truck that. full of equipment. <laughs> yeah. So that was 1948. Was he made his first collection of music concrete compositions and sort of had his own little breakthrough during that period of time. Um, and then quickly, I want to look up the Ampex origins. Ampex facts. Um, because. Bing, bing, bing. Bing, so, yeah, Bing, Ampex Bing. was started in California. Oh, that explains um, Bing's involvement. And I want to see all these fragments of information have been, like, floating through my mind all week. And I'm trying to pull them all together into a cohesive story, and it's difficult. Mm -hmm. It is. Kind of like the collage music that Pierre we make it, was making. We make it seem seamless, guys. Mm -hmm. We make it seem easy. But um, it's so I'm not. looking into the Ampex stuff now, and it's just not giving me the details. It's not I'm giving you the information for. you want. Um, because See, the there's this is... turning point where they <laughs> invented this specific machine that Pierre Schaefer got his hands on. He convinced somebody at the radio station to buy it, ah. and so that he could use it, and it changed the game. So, but I want to know more about it. So I'm going to write this down as one of my questions for the week is let's find out more about the actual machine that made it possible to make tape music. I kind of see that as, like, getting a grant, you know? Like, I know it was through his job and yeah. everything, but, like, there's so many stories, you know, like, I know that I must seem to look for every opportunity to bring it up, but, you know, I know that, you know, Buchla developing his, um, you know, first incarnation was uh, a big sum of money that he was granted. Was that from CBS? Yeah. And so, also radio. So there, there's always these like you know big sums of money that come along and, and help these people. You know, I feel like Kickstarter. Radio had all the money at the time. Kickstarter is kind of like the modern 
version of that or like crowdfunding you know any yeah. crowdfunding platform you know I because see I guess radio is dead TV is dead the internet is all we have and well, the internet have is us we have to take it into our own hands but that's sort of the equivalent I would say like somebody funding a Kickstarter and then bam they're off but because these corporations at the time were the ones with the access to the materials the raw materials and the sort of pipeline to get it to people all these things kind of converged in this the ball was in that court to make it possible uh, <laughs> just a brief little exit because our heater is about to come on and, and, and it's really loud so below the roof off of our house you know it's it's the bane of our it's existence very loud. um uh, there's so there's also a lot of people that he influenced and taught like we were saying he was a mentor and teacher at the studio that he built and uh, so there's like a whole trail we could go down of all the people that he influenced as well. Man, <sighs> I know Jean Michel Jarre is one of them. Yeah, that was a fun thing to find out. Um, that he was a student he at was GRM. A student at GRM, yeah. Yeah. So I guess was GRM connected to a college directly, or was it? No, no, it was from the radio station. Like they just started it themselves. Mm. Just Pierre Schaefer and Pierre Henry. So you could go if you had this interest, maybe they accepted like interns or Yeah, did they accept students? They may have partnered with the university, you know, I'm curious. sort of behind the behind the scenes. But um oh right, I have this pulled up already. There's this cool it's website called 120years.net, which is 120 years of electronic music, the history of electronic musical instruments from 1800 to 2019. I guess they've been updated to 2020 yet. Um, but I cool. go to this a lot, and they have a good archive here on the GRM. It awesome. says it was started in 1951. It's got some cool pictures of the console. Oh, that late, huh? Yeah. Well, his first composition was 1948, so yeah, only yeah, a couple years sense. later. Yeah, only a few years later. Um, it was an electroacoustic music studio founded in 1951. Um, Probably the premiere. And it was based at the RTF. Sorry, not RDF, the RTF. RTF. It was changed to the Radio Diffusion Television Francais because it went from radio to television. Probably the premiere, like, talk about gear porn. Like this website? No, that their institution. Yeah, yeah, they're probably like the you know just for those who are interested in tape music, and who are interested in you know the kind of music equipment you use to to record music concrete. You know, it's probably like you know like Heinbach. I'm talking to you. Like <laughs> he's listening. <laughs> um, you know, like. It's probably the premier place, you know, that you would want to explore. I feel like it was probably way cooler, you know, back when it first... I think it was mostly known as the Music Concrete Studio. Yeah. And it was in Paris. And who doesn't want to go to Paris? Right. I mean, and then soak up the sights of Paris. It's already considered the hub of all things chic and cultural and forward thinking so i've heard that it was still very very cool like in the 70s you know like in the, the studio yeah like it was um, in the mid 70s i want to read all of this i think that's when jean michel jarre went there maybe 60s 70s 70s some, some yeah. There, yeah um there's so much so we could get into like all this technical stuff about what music concrete is and you know, what acousmatics is, and, you know, I could watch lectures on that all day, because it's, I don't know, I like this idea of talking about sound, I think it's so hard to talk about music and talk about sound, because it's something we experience with um, our physical bodies and our brain waves, um, and we and have everybody interprets responses it to it. A little different, um, you know, so it's, it makes it very subjective. But talking about um, sound as being separated from its source, I feel like it's a, it's a very, very specific thing to discuss, but it kind of helps open me up to a lot of other ideas about sound and music, and it gives me some language around it that I've been needing. Mm. And I really, really like that is sort of the heart of music concrete and tape music, as we're calling it, um, is the idea that sound is being disconnected or severed from its source. So when you hear, if we go back to the train sound, of course, um, if you hear the sound of a train, your brain is going to go, that's the sound of a train. 
Um, we are sort of evolutionarily wired to hear sound and say, I need to know what the source of that sound is so I know if it's safe or not. Um, our yeah. ultimate survival mode so kicks very in. very primitive. Yeah, so sound is one of those things that we use um, to determine if we're safe. Instinct. And we're sort of uh, rewiring our brains when uh, we separate the source of the sound from what we're hearing. So if you take the sound of a train, you record it to tape, and you slow it down or you reverse it, um, you put it in a different context, and you create music from it, then you can take these everyday sounds and separate them from their source so that your brain is not trying to figure out what it is anymore. And I would say that Pierre Schaefer, that's kind of what I was talking about earlier, became obsessed with this concept and idea. Yes, he wrote many books about it. And um, he would be very quick. I, th I found it interesting that he would be, in almost a little humorous, that he would be very quick to, to turn it around on the listener and mm -hmm. be like, you're doing it all wrong, pal. This is how you should be listening. Like, it's, if you aren't interpreting this, if this isn't blowing your mind and the, is not the coolest thing you've ever experienced in your life, it's on you. I am doing my job very, very well. It's on you. <laughs> it's on you yeah. if you don't like it. I love that attitude. It's just, it's hilarious. It's awesome. He was striving for something beyond um, songs and beyond classical. I think, you know, most of what I've read is him, you know, comparing to classical composition because that was most of what there was. There was classical music what and then there was you... jazz and pop. But that's, you know, he's kind of in that realm where classical music his, is still pretty mainstream. That was his competition, you know, yeah. like, as compared to now where you'd be like, we are the cosmic variation of tape music, you know, and there's still <laughs> like a sea of people that are doing it, you know, like then it was like literally you... They were classical, like, wait, so you're a cl classical composer? Yeah. Jazz was still kind of a word they were trying to come up with, like, you know, like... Yeah, 1948, for all, sure. All that stuff was, you know... Very what a time, the late 1940s to the early 1950s. And a time like when you could just show up and say, I think I'm interested jazz. in this. And they'd be like, okay. We have ahead. a studio for that. Come yeah, on in. let's put you in this room. There was a lot of, Great idea. I don't know if it was competition or collaboration. He did work with Stockhausen. Um, so the, the closest thing that they compare the GRM to is the uh, WDR studio in Germany, um, which was more about... They were really focused on researching the, the tools mm -hmm. and building the tools, um, not so much just making music for music's sake or studying sound. We'll be covering Stockhausen at some point. Yeah, we'll be hopping so, all over the just, world and back just know that. through time. <laughs> we're yeah. trying to cover it all. They're also tied together as well. And there is no rhyme or reason to our order. We're jumping all over the timeline. <laughs> it's like whatever is exciting us. We're jumping all over the map. Um, you know, so don't expect this to be, you know, a narrative that is, you know, formed from... It, there, it might happen randomly. You might because... be able to find some clues that we don't even know we're leaving. Um, but his studio was built around his own theories about tape, tape manipulation, <laughs> the core of everything, um, recording and editing. Um, and he did, this was very interesting too, as he was developing these techniques, he also invented some stuff to use as well. Um, Didn't they have a 10 head delay? 10 tape head delay? I believe that is the, is that the phonogene? Ooh, we now it. we're getting into phonogene I, um, and... I, yes, the phonogene is a one-off multi-headed tape instrument designed by Jacques Poulon. Um, there were three versions created. Any make noise bands out there? <laughs> yeah, this might sound familiar. The chromatic phonogene was a tape loop driven by multiple capstans at varied speeds, which allowed the production of short bursts of tape sounds at varying pitches, defined by a small one octave keyboard. Sampler much? The sliding phonogene created a continuous tone by varying the tape speed via a control rod. That sounds way cooler than the keyboard to me. That one sounds, anything with a control rod has got my attention. Um, 
And then the Phonogene Universal allowed transposition of pitch without altering the duration of the sound and vice versa. Obtained Whoa, how did they do that? Through a rotating magnetic head called that's, the Springer Temporal Regulator. That's t that's similar, time stretching. Similar to VHS video. So the, the head like followed it around so that you could you could change the pitch and it would still stay in time. That is insane. Yeah, that's insane. That so they were doing insane. some crazy stuff. I think if all you're doing is working with tape manipulation for decades, like you get to this crazy place. Right. Plus they had, you know, like I said, a lot of people were around and so they had a lot of collaboration. I think most good things come from putting your heads together. Um, yeah. I don't have a picture I of the agree. phonogene. I only have a picture of the morphophone. Morphophone, morphophone also sounds very familiar if you're a make noise fan. It's like they put the phonogene and the morphophone together to make the morphogene. Yeah. The morphophone was a type of taped loop delay mechanism. A tape loop was stuck to the edge of a 50 centimeter diameter rotating disc and the sound was picked up at varying points on the tape by 10 magnetic heads. This is what you were talking about. Oh, so that's the morphophone. So one was recording, ten. one was erasing, and 10, and uh, sorry, where is it? And 10 playback heads. So there were 10 points of entry that I assume you could like hit a button and go to like head five. I would imagine. And then like hit another button and go back to like but they head did, one. They built this and designed it. So. And so if a tape loop was, say, like running on that, you could sort of like window around, which is something that, you know, now but this is what it looks easy. Like. I will link specifically to the Morphophone. One of my favorite audio applications, MLR, uh, by Brian Crabtree and the Monum uh, bunch. Uh, <laughs> Let's see if this will pull up the picture. Uses that. Uh, yeah. So that's the morphophone that we're talking about. Oh, it's like showing up as a GIF, which is really interesting. Uses that philosophy, uses <laughs> that, that way of working, which I think is really fun. There's a giant GIF over my face right now. Uh, so this stuff looks like it's built like a tank, but also like it could be in Dr. Frankenstein's so, lab. Yeah, a lot of this material to me looks uh, very like military yeah. grade. Mm -hmm. um, you know, all metal. Yeah, where were they getting the materials? Hardly I'm gonna I'm gonna have some questions about the the inventions. And here. each thing is like a one off, you know, like so that's very expensive to fabricate one of anything. Yeah, yeah. I think they were only building these for their own use. Like they had an idea of what they wanted to do and then they were like, oh, I guess we have to design Do we build know this. anything about, is there a electrical engineer or, you know, mechanical engineer or, you know, somebody that they talk about that is responsible for being like the mad scientist? Jacques Poulin. Inventor of the equipment. Let us find his information. Ah, I had a feeling there was a guy. He is always the, a guy. All of these things were built by him. Uh, so, so that's the guy to study. There is some. Um, if you're into the equipment side of things. Well, it's hard to find stuff about these guys. You really have to read the books more than anything. Yeah. Um, uh, the internet has some sense. stuff, but it's not as easily not accessible as, yeah. as I'd like it to be. And especially because we're translating everything from French. That's probably what has a little bit to do, uh, honestly. So let's see. There's this cool article. There might be more. Let's see if it's... I don't know if it's going to let me open it, to In be the honest. French realm of the internet. <laughs> there there we go. The I had to jump through some hoops to get to this article, even. <laughs> it's trying to make me sign up for something. Soundfly. Um, if this is supposed to have something about Jacques Blanc in it. Um, but... It doesn't? This well. article is saying that Pierre Schaefer is not the first one to do... Uh, this sort of electronic music, electronic music, but uh, we'll have to dig deeper into that in another conversation. So <laughs> I'm trying to see where this guy is at. There's not a lot that I could find about him. Command F, baby. It just says that he was the third <laughs> person. So they they started the GRM. It was Pierre Schaefer, Pierre Henri, and oh, Jacques just, Salon was the says engineer. Engineer. So that is enough for me to go off of. They call him the engineer. They call and he's the one who, the yeah, he's the one who built the 
The stuff. The stuff. Yeah. Okay. This is a great article in general. I might save that for later. It doesn't have that much about Ooh, Pierre Schaefer as I thought. Saving it for later. Saving it for later. Um, so, yes, those things that they invented are very, very cool. Where did it go? If you can tell, we're kind of overwhelmed by all this information. There's just so much. So we don't really know what way to get into it. Um, I think they were doing some stuff with like sound sculptures as well. He's Pierre Schaefer is a really interesting looking person too. Like he looks like he should have a show on like PBS or something talking about sound. Yeah, he kind of looks like an FBI agent. <laughs> or that. He does. Very 50s. Very 50s vibe. Always wearing a suit. I want to know what these like ring, metal rings that he's standing around. I find a lot of he pictures kinda of him standing He kind of makes me want to wear a suit a all the time. Like a six, he has like a six piece suit on. Yeah. Um, I feel like that's, that's cool. I, it's going hardcore. Very space age vibes. But he's in, there's a couple of pictures I found of him standing in the center of a room and there's these metal rings around him. Mm, were um, they like resonators maybe? That's what I'm wondering. Yeah, okay. Um, but I can't find out, like, I feel like I really need to go to the library. And he's just holding the mic up. I don't even think the library up, is going to have He's just books. in his six piece suit. They must be resonators. So I'm going to add this, see if this comes through, if anybody knows what this is. Um, I feel like the, the looks of those machines look like the kind of thing, like if you told me that you know, it was a cover up and they were actually like time machines. I would say, oh, that makes sense. You know, they weren't actually using them for making tape music at all. It does they look were, like they're trying to time travel. They, they were actually it's trying like to figure out how to get Who to bucks. another <laughs> dimension. I wonder if they had any talks about sound as a time travel force. Well, I find that the, the early sound I pioneers. I have too many tabs open. I'm losing my thoughts here. We're so much more interested in like the physics aspect mm -hmm. of sound. Like they really, you know, had to, and you, I guess you kind of have to understand it from that scientific level, you know, in order to get to a place to where you're inventing technology around, mm -hmm. you know, your sound manipulation. But like, so I have a feeling that that attracted a, like a fringe science, mm. um, you know, type of person. Um, to the world of audio, like it was, it was very uncharted, experimental and science, of sound. Yeah, yeah, they were trying to almost like investigate what sound is. Yeah, what they it does. They the science didn't of really a hundred percent understand a, a, lot, a lot of the stuff that we know today. I mean, it, I, I would say that if it wasn't for these fellows, you know, like we would not be doing what we're doing. Yeah, if they didn't have the support of their countries. Radio broadcasting right, corporations. Right, exactly. Which brings me back to if, you know, if it wasn't for these guys, we wouldn't probably even have a group to talk we about. We wouldn't have a Cosmic Tape Music and We wouldn't be here right now. Talking through the screen. So that's... Uh, <laughs> a little, little meta freak out I guess out that's why we like kind of going back to the origins and exploring their lives and their work because they have made it so that it's very easy for us to do what we do at this point. Uh, they did all the hard stuff. They invented the, the metal discs that could sever your head and decapitate you. They um, <laughs> got their heads cut off so that we didn't have to. So we to. don't have to. So we're grateful. And it's very inspiring to see, you know, what was exciting them about sound. And so it kind of brings me to the experience that we had in San Francisco when we went to this place called the Audium, which I know there will be a point where we talk about the San Francisco, San Francisco Tape Music Center, um, and I'm sure that the Audium is connected to. to them in some way, but when they talk about acousmatic listening, um, they talk a lot about sound in the dark. And I don't think they mean that literally, but you can talk about it literally as well. This idea of sound being separated from its source is like putting it in the dark. But, <laughs> well, and what else does being in the dark do? It cuts off. It heightens your your mm -hmm. vision, which would heighten your hearing automatically, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's like natural. So listening to, I also I think heard a, a little snippet of Pierre Schaefer talking about how when you aren't paying attention to sound around you, it is very annoying. The sound of life 
And he, you know, this is even before life got as noisy as it is now. If you're not paying attention to the sounds, like the refrigerator, the car going by, children laughing in the distance, um, you know, an airplane overhead, it all just sounds like noise that is annoying, that is grating, that is distracting. But if you think more like a child and have curiosity about it and you start to focus on one of those specific sounds, you start to hear music. So that's a little challenge to you. If you can um, trip your brain up a little bit in those moments when you're getting annoyed by sound or you know, going through a, a commute by train or something like that where your life is really busy and noisy and there's a lot of energy being thrown around and it can be really stressful. Find your um, joy in the sound. Find one sound to focus on and see if you can hear the music in it. Um, also, I would say that, you know, that idea of focusing on a sound, it's like expressing gratitude for the sound, uh, will turn the sound into something pleasant. It um, almost can carry you away, but don't miss your stop. For sometimes work. the strangest <laughs> and most annoying sounds, like, you know, I've had the pleasure of riding the New York subway for a year. It's a lovely way of putting it. And uh, I, there was many times that, you know, there'd be these, like, metal, like, oh, industrial, it's me right back. clangorous sounds that you would get, and they would, you know, be they would almost somewhat hurt. repetitive <laughs> and sometimes random. But, you know, anytime there was, like, a repetitive one, like, rather than, like, let it ruin my day, I would always just try to, like, you know, hear the music in it. And I suggest that, you know, I, I get the same with, with our wa with our uh, dishwasher and our fridge. Some of our appliances are a bit loud. And our bloody heater. Um, but, you know, I mean, that's, that's the challenge for the week is to, anytime you hear an annoying sound. Or you're annoyed by just sort of a collection of sounds that you're hearing that you're not sort of being specific about. Yeah. Find your joy in the sound. Um, that actually reminds me of something that I was reading about that Pierre Schaefer is considered the person who developed uh, the idea of a locked groove. That we wouldn't have groove music, like the idea of taking a loop and locking it in mm -hmm. and repeating it, you know? So taking a snippet of sound and putting it on a loop and then repeating it to create a rhythm. So the sounds you hear around you if you pay attention to them, you might already hear a rhythm, but then if you recorded those sounds and then looped them, they would create a different rhythm altogether. So it's kind of like layers of that. But uh, Jean-Michel Jarre also was the one that brought this up, that he's sort of the one who developed the idea of a locked groove, which takes uh, this sort of abstract found sound collage style of music concrete and turns it into dance music. So there's sort of a direct line to that. And I think uh, what it comes back to is our sort of, uh, there's many layers to this, but there's a tribal sort of through line here in our evolutionary biology that um, we appreciate the percussive nature of a repetitive uh, groove or beat um, to dance to, to express ourselves um, before there was instruments or recorded sound or songs. Um, and I think that has to do with a lot of our connection to nature that we may have lost in our modern times. Um, but taking these sounds and recording them to tape and looping them, it's like this, this, uh... What provides a pulse? Yeah, it's, it's our heartbeat, it's, it's what's in nature, you know, it's like oh, the very foundational elements to life that sound and music are connected to. Um, well, if you think that, about it, we as human beings have a pulse. We and sure do. We have a steady beat mm -hmm. in us. And it reminds us and that we're alive. It's, it's all sort of the back essence to that instinct. of you know our physical lives, and it so, makes sense that we would be attracted to other you know things in sounds. Yeah, 
that, that we have can't help ourselves but put things a steady into beat because this yeah. isn't it interesting that you know unless obviously you have you know a, an issue you know with your heart like it it beats regularly you know and, and if it doesn't that's even more interesting <laughs> it's true um but you know I, I just have always found that really interesting that you know like we have a steady beat inside of us and we are attracted to um yeah we're just projecting our own internal subconscious and the most nature. popular uh genres of dance music you know i was always into breakbeat and i found myself you know and if there's any breakbeat you know djs or fans you know they, they appreciated that particular genre you know getting into dance music you know that that little like side aisle in the record store was pretty lonely compared to the house you know section of the mm. store you know which is you know your, your house and techno you know were by far the most popular which have the the more steady beat um you know and your your breakbeat genres like for instance um you know breakbeat or drum and bass or you know anything with that like broken beat you know was less popular you know even though i loved it i didn't find myself in community with as many others you know in the store at any given time and I always found that that was that was interesting. Like, why why do I appreciate the broken beats as opposed to the the locked groove? But I've grown a lot more fond of it um, as I've matured in my musical taste. I would say um, I get it. In other words, now, but you know, at the time, I was always like, man, why 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 is nobody in this section with me, or why is nobody at my shows? You know? <laughs> why is no one at my shows? <laughs> The through line, the, the uh, title to my autobiography. Um, <laughs> right. The story of the Galaxy Electric. Why, why is isn't no anyone at our shows? Um, the, or why are people leaving my show because the sound is hurting their ears? Um, <laughs> right. Why are people turned off by feedback? <laughs> uh, Pierre uh, Schaefer wrote this great book, and the English translation is In Search of a Concrete Music. And it's a collection of his theories, but also his journals. Uh, one of our group members, Gabriel Guma, actually recommended it in, in our recent uh, What Books Are People Reading thread. And it just happened to be that we were going to be talking about Pierre Schaefer this week anyway. So that all ties together. Yep. Um, so he was saying what a great read it is because it's not just technical. It's also his sort of like passion for what he was figuring out. So his actual journals are in there too. So I'm going to try to find... A copy of this book and read it because I think it would be really fascinating. Definitely to want get to read that one. Head. Yeah, I mean, you told but me about that. But it's hard to find. I haven't I found it yet. I saw the the post and I was like, yeah, I got I got to read that one. Yeah, so I think um, there is oh, who's this guy? Hugh Lacane. Uh, there's this song. I'm all over the place. Sorry, I'm jumping from thing to thing, but um, I don't know. Quantum if, leap. I don't know if he. Uh, I guess where I'm going is I want to get more into some of the protégés of Pierre Schaefer and his studio um, because there were many. There's that's like a whole trail you can go down as well. So that'll be one of the things we explore this week. Is that's the good point. So once again, like he did have sort of this like shepherd, um, you know, vibe about him in the sense that like he would. You know, he taught and would sort of influence um, others. Um, you know, he must have had, like, I've, I've never really heard him talk or anything, but, like, he must have had, like, this demeanor that was very much like, come, child, you know, <laughs> I, I will teach you, you know, my ways. Like, if you were interested, he was probably very welcoming to that interest. We'll have to find out. Yeah. When? <laughs> so In all the week, afterlife. As we've been saying, this week we are studying Pierre Schaefer. We are learning more about how he came to be excited about sound and how he developed tape music and the tools that he used, the tools that he the designed Godfather of sampling. And invented, and then like who he who he taught and inspired. So we'll have a lot of questions this week in the group and a lot of resources. Um, the music that he made is um, uh, not really background music that I would put on. Um, it really grabs your attention. It requires you to listen. Uh, it is not 
easy to, it's not easy listening for the background, right? It's not Muzak. Um, so it, it will distract you because it wants your attention. So if you're interested in listening to his music, obviously we'll be posting some uh, references and resources for where you can listen to his music. Uh, but it will be something you have to kind of <laughs> sit with uh, and give it your attention because it's not easy to listen to in the background. I just thought of something like it's interesting to me that it's sort of like the opposite of drone. It is. It's literally the polar opposite of what we find drone to be. And interestingly enough, one of the the goddesses of drone, uh, Elian Radik was a young protege of his mm -hmm. that kind of went off the rails. She did not, they did not, uh, they, didn't, they didn't see eye to eye. Which, you know, he, hearing her in interviews and such, and you know, we've, we've already researched her, like that completely and totally makes sense to me because she was not a quick, she was not somebody who was quick to like agree with your thoughts and philosophies. But imagine if you're like, I'm trying to make drone. Well, she wasn't really at the time, but she kind of developed into that versus what Pierre She was Schaefer very was independent doing. is my point. Whew. Uh, but they both were. Um, but she got Which is probably she why actually they, got kicked out as far yeah, as I understand she got kicked because out. she wouldn't do things their way. She got kicked out and then droned her butt off. Like yeah. that's what I think is awesome. Like cause like, you know, music on cred is kinda like the opposite. Like it commands your attention in this sort of like listen to these randomly occurring mm -hmm. sounds that are going to shock and and like make you, you know, flee like you're being hunted. Um and, you know, then there's drone which is like Put me on, you will go off into a daze, you will forget where you are for a few minutes, you will, you um, know... It'll speak to your subconscious layers. You will focus on your task better mm -hmm. and easier. You can't focus on a task when you're listening to music on Gret, or if you're listening to, especially, Pierre Schaeffer's... Yeah. Uh, I would say another thing blend. that I was really intrigued by was the fact that because he was at the radio station working, and his studio was there, he had access to all this raw material. Uh, like raw interviews or recorded songs and things and that is a lot of the source material he was mixing in was the raw unedited Whoa, yeah. you know recordings of radio shows and interviews and things so um, he was very resourceful and took advantage of what he had and i believe he was the first one to take like a human voice and a cough and make music out of it Right, yeah, there's that call and response. Uh, I think an actor is being interviewed and the person interviewing them um, coughs and then there's sort of this like call and response back and forth between the- That he turns that into the a song. Yeah, mm -hmm. this like repetitive uh, couple of words and then a mm -hmm. cough and then mm -hmm. ba ba ba. It's pretty cool. And it's all in French, so it sounds there's, fancier. I mean, More you know, interesting to me because I don't know what they're saying. You know, coming from us, you know, English as speakers. As we said, we, we're not uh, as, it's exotic we're not well versed in, in any French whatsoever. So, the some things may be lost in translation, as they say. Uh, I'm trying to pull all the resources that I can find um, to link, so that you guys can dig into this stuff. Um, there is also the uh, we talked about acousmatics, which is the idea of separating the sound from its source and listening to sound in the dark, keeping it in the dark. Um, but also this uh, other term that they used called reduced listening. Um, and it's very, very similar, but he had all of these terms that he came up with and ways of talking about music. And he did a lot of lectures, and I think that's a lot of how people like Elian Radik um, or his other students got involved. There was a lot, people were lecturing and doing proper concerts for music concrete. Um, Stockhausen was doing that, and that's how the Beatles got into it. So this even, was all happening even Delta Plus. kind of at the same time, yeah. Um, David Warhouse went to a lecture, so right. bring back lectures, I guess, but in cool spaces, like it's hip, not just at well, universities. Well, I mean, uh, yeah, I was going to say, like... Like, obviously, people have not stopped lecturing, but I mean, as like a popular culture I was in the Bay Area, there was do. really rad stuff going on at Stanford, Mills, and all those... Colleges right. where a lot of this stuff was founded, you know, and I wish I would have attended more of that kind of stuff. But yeah, 
Well, I brought up before the Audium, which is uh, a space in San Francisco where they do uh, lead you into a room that they have acoustically treated. Highly recommended. Definitely. like uh, It's like mandatory you if you're in the Bay Area. <laughs> you have to go to this place. It is the best listening environment I have personally Yeah, it was the trippiest thing I've ever experienced. So far in my life. But in a, I mean, it's the beyond darkest. trippy, it's Well, because you're in, you go into really a good. room, you're like in a room in, that's in the interior of the building. Did you put so a link to that? I will. Cool. There's no light whatsoever. Uh, so you're in the complete dark and they're doing sort of live music concrete across, I don't know, 50 to 200 speakers. I can't remember the exact there number. There are so many. There I mean, they're everywhere. Speakers. They're literally like just buried amongst, you know, yeah. do, you, do you sit on the ground? And no, no, we were in chairs. chairs. You could sit on the ground if you People wanted to. People left. It was, it's a very uh, disorienting experience. But talk about people in line were like, "Is this your first time?" You know, like they're. I feel like they. Yeah, have you regulars. had to wait in line. There's only like so many tickets every weekend. You met some cool people in line. Yeah, like That's every, right. everybody seemed really nice. Uh, so yeah, I'll actually link to that because it ties in to this idea of sound in the dark. Um, if anyone's, if audience. anyone's in the San Francisco area, you should go uh, check their calendar for when they're having experiences. I would put it extremely high on your priority list. Yes. You might even to want to make a visit there just for Yeah, that. make sure they have something going on if you're planning a trip to the Bay Area. Uh, reduced listening is what I was talking about before that. Yep. It, is, uh, it focuses on the traits of the sound itself. Very similar idea. Which is, um, once again, cause or meaning. if that's at the heart of music concrete, uh, that's sort of the opposite of deep listening, if you think about it. I think there's Because the deep listening, thing. no, deep listening, you're, you're listening past, you're listening like through that stuff. You're sort of supposed to ignore all that stuff and get into like... Just the way it and, feels? And, and, yeah, exactly. That's exactly what I would Whereas describe Whereas reduced listening is about focusing on the sound itself and not where it's coming from or what it's interacting with. Well, paying very close attention to detail of the things you're hearing. But They're so similar. See, like, how do you... Mm. But I could easily see somebody coming you up with... You have a debate about this. I could easily see somebody, somebody like, listening to one of his uh, lectures about reduced listening and being like, I disagree, and deep listening. You know, like yeah. it, it has enough uh, points of, of difference there, I would say. To, to I feel like these are talking about the same thing, but it's like it coming from different people's or points of view. So they're yeah. giving different names. Sure. This is a whole thing about the modes of listening. Um, a little post here about reduced listening. So I'm going to link this. This is very heady stuff. Uh, Not that have we haven't of, been heady post, the entire time we've been doing I, this. I did but. post the train tune, uh, but I haven't posted that much music here. Um, it's mostly ideas. There isn't a lot of commercially available Pierre Schaefer music. There might be a lot more now than there used to be. Mm -hmm. um, but an another link, maybe I can find it. Okay. Um, Ableton had posted like a free sound library that actually involves uh, the GRM studios and actually gives you free Pierre Schaefer sounds that he recorded himself. Oh, wow. Yeah, so I'll, I'll go ahead and forward a link to that. Well, cool. Well, um, speaking of music, I think we're going to wrap up our conversation on Pierre Schaefer here and continue it in the group throughout the week. So remember, we're going to be Way posting too much to cover questions and ideas, but... and feel free to post your own questions or ideas, uh, links to his music, um, to his protégés, um, if he's inspired you, if you've used his, the sample library, uh, we want to know about it, and we want to get uh, more into this uh, godfather of sampling, <laughs> the... Uh, the originator of Music Concrete, and everyone that was around him at the time. Uh, we want to know more about it. We can. He's like, he's origins level. Yeah. Like. But uh, there haven't, like, we were struggling to find, like, fun little documentaries and stuff. Uh, it's all very serious and heady reading. And there wasn't a lot of it. To do. There was, it was hard to find, like, any sort of document. Documentary. Documentaries, yeah. It's definitely an area of opportunity. More, more books and articles and audio theorems. interested documentarian. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, 
so make um, a, a documentary. There was so much personal music posted this week that I haven't actually gone through all of it, but it's a lot of it is very very good. I would say uh, Keith McMurray's video was one of the more interesting things we've seen in a while. Um, he's playing some sort of uh, converted banjo. Was that what it was? I need uh, to know more about oh, yeah, banjo. Oh yeah, the guy with the like little arm, the side arm. There's like a the side NPC arm hitting the NPC. <laughs> it's, it's bizarre yeah, in the great. best, most interesting that was one of way. My favorite. So, um, like gimmicky kind of sort of. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I'm gonna wow. actually, you know, just copy that in. It definitely. It reminded but there's me. There's so of, much, you guys. I'm enjoying it so much. Thank you for posting and sharing all this. Great I've music. seen similar contraptions with like street performers, you know, like. It did look like he could go right out and bust. Yeah, he could go um, and bust with that. And would probably make tons of money because it's so interesting to watch. It, and it good, is. you know, it wasn't like he was just banging away. It was like in time with the it right was sounds. Very masterfully done, yeah. Yeah. The other person was Adaris Colonna, um, who's been sharing uh, his tape manipulation, uh, where he's using a cassette. I guess he's recording stuff to cassette and then he's live mixing it. Oh, cool. Um, and it's very ambient, very pleasant. So I'm gonna post both of those in the thread here. Uh, let me open another tab so I can do that. Um, but really enjoying all the music that's yeah, been shared, stuff, so guys. thank you for sharing that. Keep sharing it, keep and, it coming. You know, we've talked about DIY projects in the past, if anyone's building anything or you know, working on anything like that. It doesn't have to just be the music. I may have completed my um, my Monum Norns shield oh, yeah. today, actually. Uh, I'll have to post a picture of that to the group, but I put a case on the, the PCB and project that I had built. It was, you know, basically together, but I didn't have anything to protect it. And I had to order some acrylic, um, you know, cut, like laser cut acrylic to build a little case out of. Someone had posted a DXF file for that, so um, yeah, I, I was so able exciting. to finish that. And I'll definitely Are share. Are you documenting with the group. all of this? I, I didn't. I didn't document me fumbling around with the acrylic because I was <laughs> super like goofy with it and like rebuilt the thing like ten times until I was oh, happy I with like the size of the spacers and screws that I used and and stuff but like you know I know it was really goofy um but I did finish it and um it's it's pretty freaking awesome man it's an open source project um I can share a link to it since I'm talking about it uh but but yeah it was it was a lot of fun and it yielded a, a really cool device that it, you know you should check out it's you know based off of the Norns by Mono. Yeah, so that's what we've been up to. So feel free to share any of your DIY projects um, or, you know, ideas for ones that you might be wanting to work on. And I'm sharing some of the personal music from that thread this week that uh, jumped out to us, but we still need to go through it and keep listening because there's so much good stuff in there. So I recommend anybody uh, with some free time dig through the personal music thread for some inspiration. Um, so that's probably, all right, wait, you sent me something you wanted to share. Oh, I already shared it. Oh, okay, good. I, I'm, I'm hooked up with the, He's hooked up today. Yay. Yeah, I'm sure um, another thing. Well, thanks for joining us for another Cosmic Conversation. Uh, we are just so, so stoked to get more into Pierre Schaefer this week. I think it's going to lead us to some very inspiring ideas about sound. Um, we did, um, we weren't able to do any... Uh, live performances this week. We didn't do a drone or an improv. Um, we had some issues there, but we are rethinking some things. Um, most likely we'll be droning tomorrow, so feel free to join us um, in the morning tomorrow, Eastern time, morning. We're always afternoon. rethinking how we we're can always best... always rethinking <laughs> everything we're doing, but... Um, uh, deliver tape music. Yeah, but our improvs are something we're probably going to be rethinking uh, that so we'll let you know when we're back up and running with those but uh, we'll see you tomorrow for the drone it won't be less tape music -y, <laughs> it'll be more tape music -y. Um, and uh, like I said thanks for joining us we'll see you in the group this week uh, discovering Pierre Shaper together and uh, really excited for what we uncover please feel free to um, 
you know, once someone has started a thread or even add to the comments of this conversation, you know, please feel free to share your links. Try not to start up too many new posts uh, regarding the same topic uh, as usual, but, you know, we'd love to, you know, see and, and hear, you know, any additional material, you know, yeah, feel free to up. correct anything we've said here today. If you yeah, know we might be full of complete crap. <laughs> but uh, we're, we're trying to check all our sources before we tell you guys anything. But yeah, jump into the thread here throughout the week. Add things to the group, the main feed, and uh, we'll uh, talk to you soon. Have a good weekend. Ta-ta.